program. And so I have always been keenly interested in the origins of our world and the universe. This is our debate topic tonight. I quote, the theory of evolution is superior to the theory of special creation as an explanation for the scientific evidence related to origins, end quote. The order of the debate is in your program. Dr. Donaldson will speak first, followed by Dr. Gish. Questions are solicited, so take good notes. Sorry, I had to tell you that. <laughs> the 10 minute break is 10 minutes inclusive. So be prompt in your breaking. After two rebuttals each as listed, we will accept questions on three by five cards. These will be provided by the ushers in the lobby during the break. Any valid question is appropriate. To be chosen, they must be printed neatly, concise in length, precise in language, and directed to a single debater. To introduce the debaters, besides the information in your program, Dr. Donaldson was the National American Athletic Union discus champion in 1945. I'm sorry, John. I meant that to be a compliment. A I, was, I was only two years old. <laughs> the AAU was, of course, the predecessor to our modern NCAA, so you can imagine the uh, strength of that accomplishment. Additionally, he was an All-American AAU in volleyball in 1951. He also got married in 1951 and has four children. So I guess that could qualify you as an all-American father, huh, John? <laughs> he has served for many years on the Fresno County Board of Supervisors, but is best known as the highly respected chair of the Department of Physics here at Fresno State. Dr. Gish has degrees from UCLA and the University of California at Berkeley. In 1956, he was the assistant professor of biochemistry at Cornell University Medical College where he collaborated with Dr. Vincent de Vigno, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. Dr. Gish has published numerous technical articles and has written many articles and lectured extensively on the subject of scientific evidence against evolution. He has written several books, including Fossils, Key to the Present, Evolution, The Challenge of the Fossil Record. He's also listed in American Men of Science and who's who in the West. And now, please help me welcome our first debater, Dr. Donaldson. Thank you. I thought I should begin by telling just a little bit more about myself. Uh, I'll try to keep it short. I was brought up as a Christian. I uh, remember brought up, in fact, and baptized in the Disciples of Christ Church uh, back in Houston, Texas. Uh, I've been a member, I, in fact, I'm, I'm a member and choir director at the College Community Congregational Church. The, uh, there must be a few of us out there, good. You know, the, the Congregational Church is the Church of the Pilgrims, the Pilgrim Fathers in this country. It's now become that, a part of the United Church of Christ, but it's been around a long time. Uh, I'm telling you this, well, I better say one other. I was, I've also been moderator, which is lay leader of that church. It's about as far back in time as my discus throwing, uh, <laughs> but it was a good experience to be in that situation. I'm, I'm telling you this because in my opinion, there is no conflict between science and religion. Now, I believe that I will try to get enough evidence uh, to convince at least some of you that it's quite possible uh, to be working both ways at the same time and to find them working together, not in opposition. Let, let's start. I don't want to spend very much time on religion. But the, it's not really the main subject here 
But it turns out, as I will show you, that it, when we talk about creationism, the whole subject of religion does become important. So I want to spend just a little preliminary time on that. The chief tenet of creationism, as I understand it, and I didn't really know anything about creationism until I took on this assignment, but I've done quite a bit of reading since. The chief tenet is a belief in the divine inspiration of the book of the Bible, and as such, as it, uh, that Genesis can be taken as a literal scientific account of the creation of the world. I'll go back and talk a bit more about that later, too. But it's a very strange thing, it seems to me, because where did we get Genesis? Genesis was around for a long time as part of the Jewish Bible, uh, the Pentateuch. Uh, we have adopted it, Christians, I say we, being one, you don't have to be a Christian to be a scientist or anything of this nature, of course, but Christians have adopted uh, this Jewish Bible, that part of it, they've added on tremendously important parts in my opinion, but they have adopted that and they've changed the meaning completely. Jews don't believe that Genesis was meant to be a literal story, a scientific story of the creation. They think it's a, a beautiful, poetic table of how the earth was formed. The so-called mainline Protestant churches are in very much the same situation. Uh, Methodists, Episcopals, uh, Presbyterians, Baptists, specifically were in in the, specifically the Arkansas state law, which I'll talk a little bit about, they were in on the side against requiring the teaching of creationism in the schools. The mainline Protestant churches do not believe that that is part of religion. I think Genesis is a gorgeous thing. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. I'm a choir director. I'm going to be directing Franz Joseph Haydn's Creation, a wonderful piece of work which is built on that story. I'll be directing that next May with our church choir. A, a wonderful, inspiring piece of work, but a poem and not something that we want to take literally. Now, so I'm sure that many of you are going to feel if you don't take it literally, what does it mean? But the point is, the people who made it up in the first place, who created that part of the Bible, did not take it literally. They do not now take it literally. And a great many Christians, whether the majority or not, I can't say, do Is, that, is it still on? Yeah, there it is again. Uh, do not believe that uh, the first chapter of Genesis is to be taken literally. Let's see, I just walked off without the slide. I want to show just one quick slide on Genesis. Can you see that? It seems pretty dark up here to me. Can you see that all right? All right, fine. What I've done is just to take the story of the creation as told in the first chapter of Genesis and put it in order. Uh, the first day is number one, the things under one are the first day, the things following two are the second day, and so forth. Uh, as we run down, uh, I put asterisks on a couple things. You notice that God created the heaven and earth in the, from the first day. You notice that on the second day, again, he created the heaven. Uh, on the third day, again, he created the earth. He created light on the first day and separated the light from the darkness but on the fourth day he created the sun uh, there's several things here which I from my best understanding of comparing sources now this is just specifically from the King James Version uh, my understanding is there's no real doubt about the ideas and the order of these ideas uh, from, from any of the known sources for the Bible. 
I'm not an expert on this. I could be proved wrong, but that's my understanding of it. But now let's go to the next chapter. In chapter 2, starting down about the second verse, I forget exactly where, we begin the new test. Now, heading this is really on the day that God created all of these things, as if the second story is talking about a day of creation. Okay, we come down starting with heavens and earth, plants and herbs. You note, plants don't get done until the third day down here. Okay, mist and rain, well, they weren't mentioned in the first one, so we don't quite know where they were. Man comes in next. Adam was created. Uh, you notice earth down in the very sixth day here, man, male and female, on the first. Okay, then after the Garden of Eden, the trees were created, the rivers were created. Uh, then there was kind of a side thing. God gave a lot of instructions to man, specifically to Adam, about what he was supposed to do. Okay, then the beasts of the field were created. You notice here in, in the, the first one, of course, the beasts of the field were specifically created before Adam. Okay, and then finally, after all this, woman, Eve, was created. You know, there's no problem with this unless you believe that Genesis is a literal, scientific account of the creation. Uh, it's, each is a beautiful and meaningful tale of the creation. Just about every civilization there is has a, some kind of a tale of creation. And that's really, uh, this is really two of them specifically in the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, which do come in here in Genesis. May I have the lights, please, again? The, the house lights. How do I get those? Do you know? Moderator? Yeah, here they come. What, what do I need to do to get the lights back on? Ask for it. I guess we're still dead here. Back on again? I believe the wheels which God created that we were just hearing. I'm not quite certain what that was. May we have the lights again, please? The house lights. Maybe it'll happen again. Thank you. There have been other cases where a strict interpretation of religion and science uh, did run into some problems. This, the case we all know about, or at least know something about, was back with the Catholic Church in the time of Galileo. Uh, in fact, a little before Galileo, really back to Copernicus in the middle of the 1500s, but coming more to a head in the 1600s. Uh, the Bible didn't tell us that we've got to believe that the earth is at the center. I think it says it in one place, but one small sentence says that the earth is at the center of the universe, and it was not something that people had taken real seriously, but the church in that time had picked up much of the philosophy of Aristotle, who was convinced it was at the center and made a lot, of, a lot about that. Well, when it turned out with evidence, observational evidence that really couldn't be refuted, both telescopic and measurement uh, and calculation of orbits, this kind of thing, that the Earth was in orbit about the sun, the church had a terrible time with that. Uh, I guess I'm stating that because you want to be very careful that your religion uh, doesn't really try to explain all the scientific facts. Religion, in my opinion, is to try to tell us how to live and how to treat each other, not to tell us how the heavens were made, how they revolve, and we've made this exact mistake at times before this. Just one further comment, and I'll leave this one entirely. Uh, 
the whole statement about divine inspiration. I believe, I, I, truthfully, I believe that God created the earth, the universe. But I don't, when it comes down to the divine inspiration of the Bible, I, I really, I believe I believe that also, but in very different degrees of divine inspiration. I don't believe there's anyone who can read Deuteronomy or particularly Leviticus and read about the purification rites for a woman who's just had a child, or perhaps the purification rites for a woman who's just finished menstruating, and find that as divinely inspired. Oh, I'll get one more too. There's specific rites laid down for how you must make your burnt sacrifices. I don't believe anyone can find that divinely inspired to the extent of love your neighbor as yourself. Maybe you can. Uh, I don't believe those are in the same ballpark at all. All right, now let's go on to the heart of, Christ, of creationism. Again, I tell you that I really did not know what creationism stood for, but I tried to find out. Uh, there's a specific statement. Let's see, where have I got that? That should be slide two. May I have that slide two, please? This is, par this is part of a statement uh, that was formed, really, to bind together the members of the Creation Research Society. I believe that was formed in 1962. I've got my notes, but I can't see them right now. This is only part of the statement. Uh, and I'm not quite certain that the very first three words, uh, that the I really belongs there. I think maybe it's we rather than that, and that everyone just had to subscribe to it. All members of the Creation Research Society had to subscribe to this statement as, uh, to be members of that society, as I understand it. And very specifically, I understand that Dr. Gish is or was a member of that society, and I feel confident he has signed this statement. Uh, if he hasn't, I'd like him to say so. All right, well, it's nothing terrible. The Bible is the written word of God because we believe it to be inspired throughout. All of its assertions are historically and scientifically true in all of the original autographs. To the student of nature, this means that the account of origins in Genesis is a factual presentation of simple historical truth. It goes on. There wasn't enough room on the slide, uh, but the next major belief is that there was a worldwide Noachian. I don't know where that word came from, but. Uh, the flood is told of in the Bible that Noah, where Noah built the ark, anyway, this worldwide flood, uh, which turned things upside down. And the third major premise and part of this statement is that the earth is of relatively small age, relatively young age. Uh, this looks to me not like the kind of thing that any scientist would sign. I guess that's really the point of saying this. It does not look scientific. It looks thoroughly religious. Uh, and, as, you know, as, as I understand science, at least, the key to science is to keep an open mind and do your best. That doesn't mean you can't come to tentative conclusions, but I don't think a scientist would ever say something like this very first statement. I now believe and will continue to believe in anything essentially. The whole idea of science is that you're supposed to look for the evidence and see what happens with that. Good. May I have the house lights again, please? That worked much better. I think evolution is working for us here tonight. <laughs> now, there was a very interesting legal case. The state of Arkansas, uh, back in 1981, passed a law. Uh, well, I guess the essence of it, it, it was that it required balanced teaching of evolution and creation science. Creation dash science was the exact, in fact, it creation dash science and evolution dash science. That's the way the thing was put. Uh, there was a lot of testimony in the district court in that case, and some of it I thought was fascinating. And 
thoroughly applicable to what we're doing right now. The statement by the judge in charge of the case, as he made his summary, included this quotation from Dr. Gish. Creationists have repeatedly stated that neither creation or evolution is a scientific theory. Parentheses, and each is equally religious. Uh, parentheses closed. Qu end of quotes. It had another statement by James Morris, who is another member of the Institute for Creation Research, really the founder of that institute. Uh, if man wishes to know anything about creation, and then there's some things which I left out, which I don't believe are pertinent here, his sole source of true information is divine revelation, end of quote. The court looked very carefully at what creationism was. I outlined it very quickly, and that was essentially what the court came to, is saying those were the major things that were part of creationism. The court made this statement. Creationism, the tenets of creationism, are not, and this is a quote here, not merely similar to the literal interpretation of Genesis. They are identical and parallel to no other story of creation. Parentheses close, I mean, quotes ended. A second quotation, the leading, this is a quotation from the judge, not the first two quotations were from Drs. Gish and Morris. This one's from the judge, and the one coming now is from the judge. The leading creationist writers, Morris and Gish, acknowledge that the idea of creation described in paragraph 4A1, which specifically is what we had up here, essentially the, the part of the of instant, the very quick creation uh, from nothing, is the concept of creation by God and make no pretense to the contrary. Uh, quotation ended. Well, now that's, that's all very interesting. I read an interview with Dr. Gish in this, what was it, the Saturday paper, and found that specifically he was coming uh, because he wanted to be sure that, uh, he, he was very upset about the way our high school textbooks handle science, that they include evolution only and do not include creation science or creationism. I, you know, it, it's kind of amazing to me that Dr. Gish would admit, uh, and I, maybe, he's, maybe he was misquoted by the judge, I, I hope not, but would admit that creation science is not a science and then ask that it be made part of the science curriculum. You know, it would be logical. Uh, it seems to me if I came to that conclusion, and his conclusion was that evolution is also not a science but a religion, then I would be out trying to ban evolution from the textbooks of our science classes. They say that can only be taught in a, in an, in a, a religion course, not in a science course. But that apparently is not the picture, at least if the quotes in the paper uh, that I saw were correct. I have seen other things of their publications which make me feel the quote in the Saturday paper was correct, though, that they, they really want to have creation science taken seriously as a science offering in our schools, even though they themselves, both the top two gurus in creation science, admit that it is not a science and is part religion, at least part religion. All right, now let's get on away from this. I want to go to some evidence for evolution. Uh, first place, I'm a physicist. I'm not a biologist. I don't know all the details of how birds evolved, all these things. I've read about them for years. I know the general ideas. I'll try to quote a couple and keep my hands somewhat clean on some of the others so I won't make any great mistakes. There are lots of people out here who know a tremendous amount more about how specifically how birds evolve from one condition to another, a lot of these other things than I do. But let's start with the biological evolution anyway. Okay, where do we get the ideas of biological evolution? It comes from many different places, 
The most impressive place to me is the fossil record. Now, Dr. Gish has written a whole book stating uh, the fossils say no. Okay, but uh, let's look at the fossils as if we were, uh, say, the way we look when we're thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow. We expect the sun's going to come up, don't we? We're pretty confident that things are going to continue to happen uh, pretty much the way they have. That doesn't mean that nothing will ever change, of course. We know that one day there are going to be clouds. We know there are going to be eclipses of the sun, although the chances that we see a total are pretty small, even in our whole lives. But we know they exist. We know a lot of things of this nature. Uh, nonetheless, we need to get on and see what seems reasonable. This, this whole idea that things have happened on a regular basis and will continue to happen on a regular basis uh, has a name, uniformitarianism, and it's really the foundation of science. If we didn't think that there was some system to science, no one would try to study it. Back in prehistoric times, people couldn't see a system. They'd see a lightning storm, and this had to be an act of some supernatural power. You know, we laugh at that now. We understand. We don't understand everything. Don't, don't ever let me be quoted as saying we understand everything about lightning. We do not. But we understand a tremendous amount about it. We know where the noise comes from. <laughs> a lot of these things. Okay, uh, so we've come a long way in that kind of thing. All right, and in science generally, if there is no system to be found, we're wasting our time. I think there is a system to be found in physics, geophysics, geology, biology, astronomy, astrophysics. There's a great list of places where people have searched for regularities and have found them. Let's start with the geology. Anybody who's been to Grand Canyon, how many of you have been to Grand Canyon? Been down, to, let's see. Oh, a bunch of you. How many of you been down to the bottom? Still quite a bunch. You've got some good legs on there. Or maybe you sat on the donkey, the, the mule, on the way down. I haven't yet forgotten my coming back up. It was easy going down. Uh, when you look at that, you might be puzzled unless you read a little bit. You, by the time you read a little interpretation, you realize that what you're seeing is one layer of rock on top of another layer. One, rock, one layer may be 500 feet thick. It may be 1,000 feet thick. Then there'll be another layer. Maybe it changes immediately to a different color, uh, different texture. Maybe it's a very thin layer and something else happens. There are all kinds of possibilities. But you can just see one layer stacked on top of another. It was a tremendous job for geologists to try to put this column together, really to understand, mostly because things happen. It's not just that we, everything sits there peacefully and you lay down a layer of sandstone and a layer of shale and a layer of sandstone and a layer of limestone. Uh, those things are all laid down in completely different circumstances. For sandstone, the country's got to be a desert. For limestone, you've got to be underwater. Uh, okay, there are all kinds of sea fossils in limestone and all things of this nature. Okay, so... Uh, it's not a very simple thing. And we know very well that land rises, we get erosion. We all know about erosion. We read about it all the time, what's happening to our farmland. And we know uh, if we go up to Yosemite, we see all those boulders that are down in the Yosemite Creek, for instance, or better yet, down in the Merced River. They all came from up above, didn't they? They've been eroded away at some point, maybe a long time back, maybe a short time back. Erosion continues, mountain building continues, things move up, they move down, different parts of the earth. You can get lakes, you can get inland seas, you can have oceans. Uh, so it, it's not a simple record. But the geologists went to work, and by the time, really, by 100 years ago, they pretty well, in fact, before Darwin, Darwin was about 100 years ago, wasn't he? Okay, so back 20 or 30 years before that, at least, they really had things pretty well figured out. Uh, there's been a lot of information added still. Comparing our information now with information, say, in 1850, the guys would go home and cry for all that they'd missed. But we've had a lot of opportunities that they hadn't had. All right, at this time, essentially 
the complete record of sedimentary rocks is available. Now, sedimentary means rocks that are laid down in layers. As part of that, in many places, there have been things like granite. Our whole Sierra, almost, is granite. That granite was extruded up from underneath, or it was hotter, down below, and went into sedimentary rocks. In fact, our Sierra mostly went right above. They were under layers of sedimentary rock, but right above other layers. And so they, the, the, the Sierra, are essentially solid granite in and, and many places. Not all. You'll see other things, too. But they've taken this whole record. Utah is a wonderful place to look with Grand Canyon. Uh, and, well, I shouldn't say Utah for that, Arizona, but moving on up into uh, Bryce Canyon and Zion Canyon. You get layer after layer, and with all the study that's been done, they've really been able to put those things together and figure out in what order they were done. Now, this was done back before anyone could do a very good job of finding out how old these things were. Geologists watched, and they could find out how fast things are being built up now, how fast rocks are being built up in the bottom of a lake. Not rocks, mud. It wasn't, of course, it wasn't rocks then. It has to sit under pressure and high temperature before it becomes actual rock. But they could watch and see how fast things are building up right now. And the principle of un uniformitarianism uh, says, well, it's probably about what happened. The laws were about the same then as they were now. Uh, okay. Since that time, and incidentally, in that process, there were some very interesting results. The geologists found that they needed hundreds of millions of years to build up the sediments that are found. Thousands and thousands of feet thick layers of sediments. Higher than any mountain now. What did there, 50,000 feet total? Something like that. I'm really not sure the exact amount, but something like that. Higher than any mountain on Earth. But of course, they're not all up in the air. A lot of them have been pushed down, a lot have been eroded away. But when you put the whole column together, it's something like that. Then along came radio, oh, there, this was still controversial though, because there was another guy, a fine physicist, who made a big mistake. Physicists do it occasionally. They really put their feet in their mouths, and this guy did. He did some calculations on heat loss through the Earth's surface. And he decided the Earth couldn't be over 10 million years old. It would have lost all its heat. Well, by now we can make the calculation and show that there's enough heat even under the premise that just that the Earth had been molten and the heat still coming out without any new production of heat. We can find enough heat to keep the Earth going for longer than the 5 billion years approximately that we believe the Earth has lived now. But he, he, didn't, he had a lot of things wrong in his calculation. Anyway, there was this big thing, 10 million years or hundreds of millions that was going at that time. Then along came the discovery of radioactivity, about 1900. And people uh, dug into radioactivity. It was fascinating, of course. This is physicists and chemists' business. They dug into radioactivity, and before long, uh, were understanding quite well a lot of the things that were going on. It turns out that in the rocks that are all around us, there are several what we call radioactive isotopes. These are specific kinds of uranium, of, let's be a little more uh, like normal stuff, potassium in us. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, rubidium, strontium, things, there were several of these things uh, that turn out to have what we call long half-lives. In other words, uh, it takes a long time for, if you have a certain amount of it here, say I've got this much, it takes a certain half-life for that much of it to change radioactively into some other material. That's what a half-life is, the time for half of it to change radioactively. Well, it turned out there's several things that have half-lives of from, oh, about one billion to about 40 billion years. This is not an easy measurement to make, but they've gotten very good at making such measurements. Uh, most of these half-lives, particularly the important ones that are used for radioactive dating, are known to 1% or better by now. You know, it's hard to believe we can measure something that takes 5 billion years to within 1%, but we can. 
and these half-lives are very well known. There have been all kinds of experiments done to try to change that half-life, to see if we can make this stuff decay faster, decay slower. The answer is no. There's one slight exception. I don't think it's really even worth, it's a little complicated, but I'll tell you about it anyway. Most radioactivity occurs this way. You've got a nucleus, it's very tiny. You've got electrons in, moving in clouds around that. This is a simple-minded, non-quantum mechanical viewpoint. From the nucleus, something is suddenly given off. It can be an alpha particle, which is a helium nucleus, that second most abundant material in the universe. Or it can be an electron, or it can be a positive electron, a positron. There's one other kind that occasionally happens. Instead of this thing giving off something, it takes an electron from the electrons that are in orbit and takes it into the nucleus. That one has been found to depend on pressure. But there's an obvious reason. The higher the pressure, the closer the electrons are to the nucleus, and the more likely they are to be absorbed. Except for that, no one has been able to find any thing that makes a change in the decay rates. So these are pretty solid. You know, they're not perfect. Uh, there's always another decimal point to measure, and maybe there'll be errors found. But people in labs across the world using different techniques, different instruments, have made these measurements, and they're pretty good. Now, the advantage of it is this. Let's take uh, uranium-238 as a specific example. You know, we know that there's a lot of uranium-238 around. It's the main isotope of uranium. In other words, 99 point something percent of all the uranium that we find is uranium-238. It decays, gives off an alpha particle to start with, does other things. Over a long chain, it's an exciting thing, and it was a hard job to figure out what that decay chain was, but it's now very well agreed. It ends up as lead-206. 206 is a specific brand of lead. It's not your common, ordinary variety lead. Apparently, it only comes from that particular decay. Okay, now, if we find some uranium in a crystal in a rock, we can check, we can find out how much uranium is there. Now we can check, we, got, we have to do chemical separations. The chemists are good at this stuff. Dr. Gish knows all about how to do that. Pro well, I'm not sure he's biochem, so maybe, maybe he hasn't done that, but he probably does. Not I. I don't know how to do it. Okay. They compare how much lead-206 is there with how much uranium is there. From this, it's a very simple mathematical, phys using physical law. I shouldn't say it's just mathematical. It's using the standard laws of physics they can find out how long this material has been decaying. There's some ways this can get messed up. One of the things, one of the decay products is called radon. You've, a lot of you have been reading about radon in the last three weeks in the paper. Radon's in this room right now. Not very much, I hope. Uh, but a little bit of it's in here, and people are worrying about what effects it's having in our homes. Radon is one of the decay products of U-238. And it's a gas. So if this crystal is too small, or if it's molten, that gas is going to get away. But if that crystal is a good-sized crystal, and if it's solid, the radon can't get away. It doesn't last very long. You know, if it had a million years to get away, it might. But it's only got, let's see, what's the half-life of radon? One day, uh, one minute. OK, it doesn't have very long. Uh, so it mostly, most of it, very little of it gets away. That's still what we measure but that's mostly from fine soil rather than from bigger crystals. Okay, so we find one of these crystals, we do this job on it, and we find out how old the thing is. We don't trust it completely. We don't trust anything completely, I guess, that's a measurement. But we, then we try some other ways of measuring the same thing. Turns out we can measure the rubidium and find out how the rubidium has been converted to strontium. There's some stuff we can do with the thorium that was in it. Thorium has a very long half-life and is a little harder to work with because it's so long. Uh, but it, nonetheless, things can be done there. The potassium, the potassium is a rather nice one. It has a simple decay chain. Just gives off a beta particle or picks up one, one of the, well, it gives off a plus or minus beta and changes into another element, which we can separate nicely. When these different methods agree, 
then we feel we've got it. And what this tells us is not how old those elements are, but how long they've been in that crystal. Since that thing froze so that it became solid, it'll tell us how old that is. Dating of this nature has been done across the world by hundreds, thousands of people on thousands to hundreds of thousands of samples. And it all makes sense with this geological column we started with this, at the beginning. The way the geologists had it worked out, the things down at the bottom have been, have been found to be the oldest. And in fact, that doesn't mean they're necessarily on the bottom now, does it? Because we wouldn't see them if they're on the bottom. They've got to be exposed before we see them. But that's the bottom of the column nonetheless. Things have been scoured off from the top, and we see this exposed. The things that are down there are about 3.7 billion years old. The evidence is very good. Specific individual measurements can be made to about 1%. And so we need, we're not just guessing. This particular piece of rock is 3.72 plus or minus 3.03 billion years old since the crystal was formed. It's that kind of thing. Okay. The whole thing has been built up and all checked, so we now have absolute dates for each of these times. Okay. It's nice that it agreed with what the geologists said. If it didn't, there'd be something that really had to be resolved. And I don't ever want to let you know, think that there haven't been odd things that happened, like one piece slipping over another, like a whole uh, eruption of lava coming out from a volcano and covering a great area. Those of you who've been through our, our northwest, have, if you've kept your eyes open, have seen tremendous flows of lava. And of course, we can only see the top one. Mostly, they're much bigger flows underneath. Uh, state, whole state at one point could be covered with lava. And then later, there'll be another. Uh, that kind of thing has happened. OK, so these layers, they can be put together. Igneous and sedimentary rocks can both be checked for ages, igneous being things that were, that were molten. Uh, sedimentary being rocks that were laid down in layers. Okay, both of these can be checked, and it all works. Okay, so what do we get out of it? At the very lowest layers, no fossils are found. A little bit farther up, single-celled fossils are found. Very simple. Now, very simple compared to you. Compared to a hydrogen atom, even the one cell atom is very complicated. But all right, let's go with it anyway. These simple things are found at the lowest levels. As we go up, things become more diverse. By the time we hit 600 million years ago, that's getting close in biological time, only the last 10% of the age of the Earth from what we know now, approximately, we start getting larger things, invertebrates, uh, some of you know all the names of those things. I won't worry about the names of them. But we start getting these things as we go on, layer after layer. Uh, we find that we're at one point getting into reptiles, the dinosaurs. Uh, we go to our next layer higher, and we find that the dinosaurs have disappeared, and we've got some rudimentary mammals. In fact, there was some overlap of those. Uh, but the dinosaurs have disappeared later and the mammals are doing various and sundry things. As we go through continuing layers, we see mammals changing from one form to another. Now, there's a specific word in Genesis that talks about after their kind. We want to be a little careful of evaluating kind because that's not a scientific word, that's a religious word. Uh, but thing, there's, I don't think there's any question that things have evolved. I can't show you all the evidence. I'll just show you one of the most famous. May I have that slide three, please? Okay, we start with the famous Eohippus from the Eocene era, about 58 million years ago. A uh, small, a dog sized, uh, doesn't look very much like a horse, but it's got legs and a tail, and the head looks a little bit horse like. Uh, we come on to 20 million years later, the mesohippus, which just means medium, hip, medium horse, uh, 36 million years ago, 
you notice that the, the, the thing on the left is what's happening to the leg. The toes have kind of welded together. Uh, we're down to something of a hoof by now. Uh, things have changed in that leg. The, the thing, critter has grown. It's bigger by now. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, 25 million years ago in the Miocene. Okay, now we've got a leg that's really changed quite a bit. Uh, the horse is looking pretty modern. Uh, let's see, how, which one of these things takes me to the next slide? Yeah, and we'll go on to 13 million years ago. Let's see, is that, that doesn't look very well focused to me. But nothing happens when I push the focus, so I'll leave it alone. Okay, if you can't read it, Pliocene 13 million years ago for this one, and the Equus, which is the modern horse, the Pleistocene in the recent period, which appeared first in fossil record about a million years ago, as shown by these things. A pretty good evolutionary sequence. There are lots of others, uh, but this is just one of them. That's a fairly standard type, uh, type of uh, sequence. Uh, I want to show just one other. Let's see, can I, uh, can I jump to slide five? Can you do that, to side, slide seven? No, I, I'd like to jump over to, yeah, and go to seven. That's it. Now, this is a very famous thing. I guess it's a bird. It's hard to know how to, how to classify it. It's the Archaeopteryx. Uh, found back about 150 million years, and it rocks about 150 million years of age. Now, this is an artist's conception. Don't take too seriously that they actually found exactly this. What they did find is the bones, and this artist's drawing is, has the bones all in the same position as the way they were found in this first cast, where, they were, where, where the, the first place in the rocks that they found this fossil. But there were imprints of feathers also. Now this, immediately, if you don't know about birds, you say, well, this thing is a bird. It's got feathers. It's got to be a bird. Its, its wings look like bird wings. But look a little more. The skull of this thing, which we can't see very well inside its head, the skull of this looks like an early reptile, which, in fact, one, it seems to be a descendant of something that became, went another way and became the dinosaurs. This has teeth. There's no bird, no modern bird that has teeth. This has a long bony tail. You know, when, when a physicist looks at that, he thinks, well, that's kind of like a peacock tail. But it isn't. A peacock's feathers all attach way down at the base of the spine. This thing has the long tail and the feathers come off all along it. There are a couple other more technical differences. There's no modern bird that has any of these things. The feathers are modern, the rest are not. Okay, this is specifically the kind of intermediate creature between reptiles and birds that we would love to find, but where we know the probability of finding it is probably small. Nonetheless, for this particular one, it must have been a pretty uh, viable bird or reptile, reptile bird. I think I'll put that in because uh, three different specimens have been found of this. One of them back about 1850 and one as late as 1950 or so. So there are three different specimens, the Archaeopteryx. This is one of the famous ones in the whole business of evolution as one of the intermediates. Now, Dr. Gish is going to tell you that, I think, I haven't got a copy of his talk, but I'm pretty sure he's going to tell you that we just can't find intermediates. You know, one is all we need. But he has a very interesting idea because as, he, as we start out, let's say we have a form here and a form here which is quite different. There's a gap between them. Okay, in the first place, those gaps are reasonable. We have a hard time with fossils. Uh, we would expect, I would expect, if this one was going to change to this, there'd be some little group off somewhere that would suddenly have a change in genes and evolve quickly into something more like this, and maybe over a rather short period of time, for 10,000 years, something like that, the probability that we would ever find any fossil remains from that little bit, that little area, in that little time, would be negligible. 
So Archaeopteryx must have been further spread than that little one. Okay, but all right, there's a gap. Okay, now let's say this is a reptile and this is a bird, and we find in here Archaeopteryx. Now, Dr. Gish's logic is not, oh, we've really improved the fossil record. His logic, again, I think, we'll listen and see, I think his logic will be, now there's a gap here and a gap here. We've doubled the problem. Uh, you know. Well, maybe so. Uh, I don't think that makes sense. Uh, I want to go to a different kind of a thing. Uh, the second law of thermodynamics is something that always comes up. The second law of thermodynamics and probability both always come up when we start talking about the things of this nature. The second law of thermodynamics is the most under, misunderstood major law of physics that there is. I've tried to teach it uh, several times. I don't claim that I understand it all. Books have been written on the second law of thermodynamics. May I have slide five, please? Okay, this is from the textbook which I last used and which we, were using last, we used last semester to teach this course in our department here. Thermodynamics, Kinetic Theory, and Statistical Mechanics, Statistical Thermodynamics by Sears and Solinger. Okay, and every process taking place in a completely isolated system, the entropy of the system either increases or remains constant. Just show me the next slide too while we're at it, would you? Similar but different, a different book. If a closed system is in a configuration that's not the equilibrium configuration, the most probable consequence will be that the entropy of the system will increase monotonically in successive instants of time. Thank you. House lights again, please. If either of those makes any sense to you, uh, you've got at least a master's degree in physics, and neither of them applies to specifically to evolution. Now, I don't want to say they don't apply the universe. They do. But the argument always is you can't get something more complicated from something less complicated. This word entropy has to do with degree of order and disorder. And so it's usually used this way that you can't, you, you start with, you can start with ordering and everything must inevitably go to more disorder. It can never go the other way. Well, let's see, we only need one counterexample, don't we? Okay. Dr. Gish began with a single cell, I think. Well, is an ovum a single cell? I believe it is. And then it's fertilized, so I guess that's two cells. And over a period of a few years, he grew into the very complicated assembly that he is now. You know, if you misunderstand the second law of thermodynamics, you can say that's not possible. But clearly it is. We're all here. We've all gone through this process. Okay, what does it mean? Well, the open system is the key. We believe the second law of thermodynamics is right. But it says for any closed system, we are not a closed system. The Earth is not a closed system. Even the solar system is not a closed system. The universe is. And so we believe this holds over the universe. We also believe if, if we take a nice box here and insulate it well and make a good strong box, it'll hold inside there. That that's isolated from other things. We've got to be more careful. We've got to keep constant temperature and a few things like that. Then we believe it holds there. Its application to other things is wild. And I've seen some of, you know, many times I've seen something where I've said, this guy doesn't know what he's doing with the second law of thermodynamics. He's getting crazy results. And it's because of misinterpretation of this innocuous looking but very complicated law, the second law of thermodynamics. Let's talk uh, probabilities just for a second, too. You know, the, I'm not going to talk about how life first began. I don't have any idea how life first began. I don't think any scientist and knows how life first began. And it's something we'd love to investigate more and will continue. Whether we'll ever know, I'm pretty skeptical of. But the, who knows? Uh, that's the kind of thing we want to try to find out because it's so fascinating to know. People make calculations showing if you shook a lot of atoms together, uh, what the probability of getting a 
single cell is even, or better yet, uh, something much simpler than a single cell. And it comes out so infinitesimal, you say it's not possible. This is all assuming that everything is just probability. I don't, f for a minute, believe that probability determines everything. I think that there are certain atoms, uh, maybe God made them this way, that are, are that have sp uh, geometrical characteristics, wave functions, I guess is what I really should say, such that they uh, much prefer to do one thing than another thing, which destroys the simple probability argument entirely, I believe. And we know very well that when we get to more complicated things like amino acids, which we have to put together to make us, that those things preferentially bind in different orientations to different other amino acids. Uh, it's not just a simple probability of shaking them together and seeing what you get. It's a very non-probabilistic -probabil thing. Still, it's very hard to see how it can happen. I don't mean that I have the answer, but I mean that anyone who takes a simple probabilistic explanation and gives that to you uh, is certainly wrong. Okay, let's do just a few more things. I, I want to concentrate on the age of the Earth for the next two minutes. Uh, first, the transcript, the, the excuse me, not the transcript, the statement uh, of the judge in a summary of that Arkansas case specifically asks, what is this recent age of the Earth? And he quotes uh, specific creationists, including Dr. Gish, to find that that age should be 6,000 years to 20,000, somewhere in that range. This comes strictly from the book of Genesis, not the 20, but the 6 does. There's a Bishop Usury back in the 1700s, 1600s, who added up the dates in the Bible, the lengths of people's lives and so forth, and found that 4004 BC was the first day of creation. Uh, and so you add to that our 1988, and you get a little less than 6,000 years. Uh, okay. I don't think there's any evidence whatever for any such age, with the exception, if you, you know, if you take the Bible as evidence, then you, that can be evidence. I don't think there's any scientific evidence for that age. Okay. If we take a couple of the things we know about, bristlecone pines. You all know bristlecone pines over the other side of the Sierra, up in the White Mountains. It turns out tremendously long-lived. With bristlecone pines, we can go by comparing tree rings directly from one sample to another, finally at the end having to go to one samples that are dead but lying around on the ground where they haven't deteriorated. Wonderful how long they last. We can go back about 8,500 years before the present, well past the 6,000, but not up to the 20,000. Well, short of the 20,000 yet. That specific kind of thing is contains wood, which contains carbon. It's been used then to calibrate the carbon-14 radioactive decay. This is a sh the other dating mechanism that we have, which is good for shorter times. Carbon, it turns out, instead of having a 5 billion year half-life, has a 5,000 year. The exact numbers are 5720, I think, year uh, half-life. Okay, so once we've got this thing checked by the calibrations going against taking pieces out of these bristle cones and check doing the carbon dating on them, we can go back to about 75,000 years quite reliably with carbon-14 dating. Well, 75,000 is well beyond the 20,000 that well, I think Dr. Gish only allowed 10 anyway in his statement. But uh, okay, and he's going to say age of the earth has nothing to do with it, but it's an intrinsic part of the whole concept of creationism, as I read it. And I've read many statements from many of the creationists that which make me feel certain that that is the case. All right, let's go back beyond that. Yes, this is five minutes, thank you. Somehow when I see somebody do that, I want to stop. <laughs> it looks like stop. <laughs> okay. Uh, Seafloor spreading is a beautiful example that was not known at all when I came to Fresno State in 1956 to begin teaching. There's been a, the geologists have had a revolution in that length of time. And incidentally, 
That kind of revolution can happen. That doesn't mean that everything before was wrong, but it means that some of the things before were wrong. It doesn't mean that their layers were wrong, but it means that some of their concepts about how things moved or didn't move were wrong. There's been a real revolution there. Okay, but here's the situation. Let's just take the Atlantic. In the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, there's what's called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It sits up like a high hill, a, not a hill, a ridge, a long ridge that winds right down pretty much the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And it falls off on each side. Not real, you know, it's not perfectly smooth. There are irregularities and so forth, but it's pretty darn good. It turns out that if that we can go two ways. If we date the rock to each side of this ridge, we find that here's the ridge over here and here, on each side, there's rock which is the same age, about the same distance from the center. It's young. Here we get older rock, older, older rock. And here's good news for the creationists. The whole seafloor, the whole Atlantic seafloor is young. The only problem is young here means 200 million years, not 10,000 years. But it is young. It's all been made from this seafloor spreading. And we can date it all back, and we can see where the, where the rock, that the end of this is going underneath continents or pushing continents apart. Incredible as that sounds, there's another thing we can do to check it. We can check the magnetism in these, in these successive pieces as they go out. We find that for a while, there'll be one kind of magnetism, the way it is now. We're at North Pole at the north. And then we'll find a stretch where the magnetism was reversed. And then we'll find another one back to what we call normal. Normal is always the way it is with us. And then another reversed. There, oh, I don't know, I think I counted 20 some of these uh, in the six million years, or I forget really just what it was, but the, a tremendous numbers of these magnetic reversals. I'm looking forward to one. Maybe we'll have one while we're alive. Uh, it's, uh, it'll be exciting to have the North Pole suddenly go to the South and all the compasses flip around. It has happened from the rock testimony, there's no question that it has happened many times. Right now, we've been on a dropping magnetic field. That's why I say maybe it's, we're on the way to going all the way. I think the, the general idea, feeling is that it probably is not. It'll probably go back up. But it may go through zero and go the other way. One further thing yet when we come to all this. At this point, we are good enough with lasers and satellites that we can actually measure. We can sit up here today and we can measure the continental plate. You know San, that LA is on one plate which is moving. Maybe you don't know. Okay. Los Angeles and the Gulf of California, Baja California, not the Gulf, down the middle of the Gulf, is on one continental plate that's moving right up alongside the main continental plate of the western United States. It's moving like this. Okay, people, geologists had figured this out a long time ago because they've been able to see right here and right here, there's similar structures, but now this one's clear up here. They've been able to see how much that was doing. Gotcha, thank you. But now we can actually measure it. We can measure with the satellite and laser beams, we can measure a movement of one centimeter in a year. We see this motion happening at about three centimeters a year, which is just what the geologists had figured out. There are a couple tricks to it, too, because it turns out there's some places where it's not going completely parallel. Things are, are screwed up a little and moving into others. That takes it down a little bit in those places. But they can measure those now. There's no reason that I can see to expect that that's changed recently. And we have uh, a many multi-million year record of the evidence across these rocks that really uh, tells us, just agrees with the kinds of motions we're getting right now. The Earth is not 6,000 years old. It's not 10,000 years old. It's 4.6 billion, older than the oldest rocks we've found. Don't have time for that argument. Yeah. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nelson. I'll, I'll leave this for you. Yeah, I leave it right on the podium, and Dr. Gish will get it there. Before Dr. Gish comes, I'd like to make a note that the timing is done by stopwatch. 
and Dr. Donaldson time was suspended during that equipment breakdown, so he got a full 60 minutes. And now help me welcome our second debater, Dr. Gish. very much, ladies and gentlemen. You know, when I stand next to Dr. Donaldson, uh, at the full height of my five feet, four inches, and as I am reminded of the fact that he was a national AAU uh, discus champion and a volleyball All-American, who, uh, who was it that said all men are created equal? I'd like to meet that guy. Well, all uh, people in general are created equal. But I think there's some very definite exceptions for some of us. Well, it certainly is my pleasure to be here this evening and have this opportunity of presenting the scientific evidence, which has convinced me and literally thousands of other scientists that the theory of evolution is scientifically untenable. That in view of the, uh, the natural laws and natural processes which are operating in this universe today, the universe could not have created itself naturally and life could never have arisen spontaneously on this planet. Now, if they could not have created themselves naturally, there's only one other possibility. They had to be created supernaturally. I've, you know, some people claim, well, there's hundreds of different ways of explaining all of this besides creation and evolution. Now I always say, well, I know of naturalistic, mechanistic evolution, and I know of theistic spatial creation. What's the third? And nobody's ever come up with a third. There are only these two possibilities. Now I want to begin by pointing out very clearly what is not being debated here tonight. Really, the age of the Earth is not the subject of this debate. The reason is this. The primary question we're interested in is not when the universe came into existence, but how it came into existence. Now, furthermore, creationists take both viewpoints on the age of the Earth. It is true that many, many creationists, I would say certainly most creationists believe that it's very likely that things are much, much younger than the billions of years that have been suggested. But nevertheless, there are a significant number of creation scientists who do believe that the Earth is very old and the universe may be 10 to 20 billion years old. And there are quite a few conservative Christian theologians who do take the Bible seriously and the book of Genesis literally, who nevertheless believe that the earth could be very, very old. So that is something that is not an issue here. Since creationists take both positions, obviously it cannot be a point of debate between creationists and evolutionists. Now, furthermore, the biblical record of creation is not to be uh, part of this debate tonight. Because scientifically, you see, you wouldn't know how long it took God to create. You wouldn't know whether he created in six days instantaneously, 6,000 years or what. There'd be no way to scientifically determine that. You wouldn't know how many families God had created scientifically today. You see, one can accept the six-day creation and so forth on the basis of what the Bible tells us. But that's not something that we could demonstrate scientifically. I believe we can demonstrate scientifically that God did create, you see. So we want to make clear what we are not debating. Of course, we're not debating my theology or Dr. Donaldson's theology, anything like that. Really, it doesn't make any difference whether creation is science or evolution is science or they're both religious. The important point is how did this universe come into existence? How did life arise on this planet? That's the important subject, you see. Certainly, I believe that neither creation nor evolution is a scientific theory because obviously Dr. Donaldson wasn't there, you weren't there, I wasn't there. There were no human witnesses to the origin of the universe. There were no human witnesses to the origin of life. There were no human witnesses to the origin of a single living thing. These events were unique. They happened only once in the unobservable past. You cannot construct a testable scientific theory about events of that kind. Creation and evolution are inferences based upon circumstantial evidence. They are both metaphysical because each involve a particular worldview. Richard Lewontin, professor at Harvard University, a most devout evolutionist, has stated in one of the anti-creationist books 
that creation and evolution are irreconcilable world views. Well, if creation is a worldview and therefore it's religious, obviously then evolution is a worldview and it's religious, certainly. Now, I want to make very, very clear, I would not infer for a moment that all evolutionists are atheist or humanist or agnostic, not for a moment. In fact, is most are not. But the theory of evolution itself is non-theistic because, you see, God is not involved in the process. He's not necessary. He is, by definition, excluded from the process. It is something that has occurred according to properties inherent in manner. And that is the question tonight. Is that possible, you see, or did the tremendous complexity, the fantastic information content of our universe and of living organism, could that have arisen through chance processes or did it require the deliberate act of an intelligent creator? Now, I want you to know, and, I, and, and now listen very carefully, I'm not saying that these people are creationists. These people today, evolutionists, who are challenging Darwinism and neo-Darwinism, the current theory, which is dogma, which is found in all of our textbooks, found in the textbooks used here in California, used here at Fresno State, and most colleges and universities throughout. Darwinism, neo-Darwinism is the dogma, but that is under challenge today. You see, Darwin brought most evolutionists over to his side, supposedly provided by providing a mechanism. He certainly didn't provide the evidence for evolution but he supposedly made it reasonable, made it acceptable because he had provided a reasonable mechanism. It made believers out of people. Today, increasing numbers of evolutionists are challenging the Darwinian concept and the neo-Darwinian theory of evolution. They're saying that evolution could not have occurred by mutations and natural selection. Natural selection could have only a very minor effect. This is not the way evolution has occurred at all. And some are saying we don't know how it happened. Pierre Grasset, the most distinguished of all French zoologists, whose knowledge of the living world is encyclopedic, he denies that mutations and natural selection had anything to do with evolution. He says we don't know how evolution occurred. Biology doesn't give us the answer. And others of equal stature are challenged the theory. There's tremendous turmoil in an evolutionary circle today. Now, you students, usually you, you don't know about this. It's not in the textbook, but it is in the scientific literature. Here's an article published even three years ago in that marvelous scientific journal called Newsweek, April 8, <laughs> April 8, 1985, on page 80, an article by Sharon Begley, titled Science Contra Darwin, Science Against Darwin. Here's what she says in the first sentence, quote, the great body of work deriving from Charles Darwin's revolutionary 1859 book on the origin of species is under increasing attack and not just from creationism, end of quote. Then she goes on and describes some of this turmoil and quarrels going back and forth among evolutionists. Then she says this, quote, so heated is the debate that one Darwinian says there are times when he thinks about going into a field with more intellectual honesty, the used car business, end of quote. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, that's not a statement by a creationist. That's a statement from an evolutionist. Here I have a book written by Dr. Michael Denton. Dr. Denton has two earned doctorates from British universities, PhD in molecular biology and an MD degree. He's now in genetic engineering research in Australia. Highly intelligent. The book is marvelously documented. The title of the book, Evolution, A Theory in Crisis. Now what makes this book remarkable is that Dr. Denton is not a Christian. He is not certainly a professing creationist. So he has no bias towards a creationist point of view. But his book is a devastating critique of evolution theory. In, on the flap of the book we read, the theory of evolution is propounded by Darwin and elaborated into accepted fact, quote unquote, by biologists is in serious trouble. The sober, authoritative, and responsible book by a practicing scientist presents an accurate account of the rapidly accumulating evidence which threatens to destroy almost every cherished tenet of Darwinian evolution. 
Later we read, not only has paleontology failed spectacularly to come up with the fossil missing links, which Darwin anticipated, but hypothetical reconstructions of major evolutionary developments, such as linking birds to reptiles, are beginning to look more and more like science fiction fantasies and serious conjectures. Then later on we read, most important of all, the discoveries of molecular biologists, of which Michael Denton is one, far from strengthening Darwinian claims, are throwing more and more doubt upon the correctness of the whole theory." End quote. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me emphasize again what makes this book so significant is not coming out of the creationist camp. It's not coming from those who signed the fake statement of faith of Creation Research Society or any other statement of faith, but a man who would not and does not accept that but it's his objective analysis of the scientific evidence, ladies and gentlemen. And that is really tremendously significant. Now here's another extremely interesting statement made by a scientist who is a total evolutionist, Dr. Soren Lovetrup, Swedish scientist, very well-known Swedish embryologist. I met Dr. Lovetrup for the first time when he and I were invited to Israel to the first annual conference on evolution and origins at Hebrew University there a number of years ago. They were both creationists and evolutionists there. He was an evolutionist. And I realized when I listened to him that he was one of these hopeful monster advocates like uh, Goldschmidt. Goldschmidt suggested the reason we don't find transitional forms between reptiles and birds because there were none that the first bird hatched from a reptilian egg. We just had these sudden jumps. Well, Dr. Lovetrop is sort of an advocate of that idea of evolution. He's totally against Darwinian evolution, neo-Darwinian, gradual change, mutation, natural selection, all of that. But here, after his book, this very significant book titled Darwinism, The Refutation of a Myth, published last year on page 422 of that book, this is what this famous Swedish scientist said, a man who is a total evolutionist, he says, quote, I believe that one day the Darwinian myth will be ranked the greatest deceit in the history of science, end quote. How's that for coming from a total evolutionist? Let me quote that again, quote, I believe that one day the Darwinian myth will be ranked the greatest deceit in the history of science, end quote. Now that is the theory that is accepted throughout biological circles today, the Darwinian theory, neo-Darwinism. This is what Dr. Lovetrup is speaking about. That is taught in all of our schools, practically all of our schools, as an accepted fact. He says, someday will be ranked as the greatest deceit in the history of science. That's even stronger language than we use. I believe evolution is wrong. I believe not only is Darwinism wrong, evolution is wrong. And someday it will be viewed, perhaps, as a joke of the 20th century. The dogma spawned in the 19th century, frozen into dogma of the 20th century, and may be viewed as a joke of the 21st century, certainly, if Love Trump is right. Now, <clears throat> what is this evidence that's been so troubling? Well, let's look at this evidence. First of all, we better define what we mean by the theory of evolution. Let me, let me use the, the definition sort of used by Julian Huxley and most people today. They say that evolution is a process of self-transformation. It is a directional process going from disorder to order, from simple to complex. We started with the chaos of the Big Bang. We ended up with the cosmos. We began with the simplicity of hydrogen gas and we ended up with the complexity of the human brain. In your body, you have 30 trillion cells of more than 200 varieties, including 12 billion brain cells. And since each brain cell is connected to 10,000 other brain cells, that means there are more than 120 trillion connections in the human brain. Just think of that. 
120 trillion connections in the human brain. Now listen, young people, you've got no excuse. We're not doing well here at Fresno State. <laughs> Just look what you've got working for you. And as Dr. Donaldson has already indicated, each individual cell is unbelievably complex. I am convinced that life is so complex, even the bacterium is so complex, that if someone could stay forever, there'd still be much about it they'd never understand. And you know, the more we learn about it, the more complex it becomes. And we see the, this grand master plan, the way that everything must be put together for life to exist and to function. And we see the evidence for purposefulness in every detail of the structure and function. As a scientist, I concluded that this fantastic organization must have had an organizer. This grand master plan had a master planner. And the evidence for purposefulness demands deliberate intelligent creation. So the creationist believes that the origin of the universe and life was theistic. God use spatial processes not operating today. And by that means, he brought into being directly the stars and the galaxies, our solar system. He created each basic type of plant and animal on this earth. No two basic types, for example, cats and dogs, did not arise from a common ancestor. They had separate beginnings. Monkeys, apes, and people had separate and distinct beginnings. They're not connected by transitional forms, as we will see, nor is there any other indication that they have arisen from a common ancestor. Now, of course, the evolutionists view things in a very, very different way. He starts with the Big Bang. He believes that billions of years ago, all the energy and matter of the entire universe was crammed together in this huge cosmic age of subatomic particles, radiation heated to trillions times trillions of degrees. Now, of course, I've, nobody has any idea where that cosmic age came from. Someone suggested maybe the cosmic chicken made the cosmic age. <laughs> Well, then where'd the cosmic chicken come from? <laughs> well, wherever it came from, there it was, and then for some equally inexplicable reason, the thing exploded. And out of this explosion, hydrogen gas was generated, and some helium. Now that's all, that's all you can get out of that Big Bang. Hydrogen, mostly hydrogen, and some helium. No nitrogen, carbon, sulfur, iron, Copper, lead, nothing like that was generated, just hydrogen gas and some helium. Now this hydrogen gas expanded out from the vast stretches of the universe. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the universe. There was nothing then but hydrogen gas. And then somehow from this, stars created themselves, galaxies created themselves, the solar system created itself, life created itself on this planet, and that first primitive form of life evolved into everything living today, including people. So we've gone from hydrogen gas to people. Now, if that's true, one could say that hydrogen is an orderless, tasteless, invisible gas, which, if given sufficient time, becomes people. <laughs> now, now, please don't laugh, ladies and gentlemen. That's what they believe. That's serious. Evolutionists believe that. They've got to believe it because there was nothing but hydrogen gas then, and now there's people. So ultimately, you see, we can trace our origin back to hydrogen gas. God is not your creator. Hydrogen gas is your creator. And it was a totally mechanistic, naturalistic process. If God had to do anything whatsoever during this process, obviously, it'd be on the Now that's, in general, the theory of evolution versus the general concept of creation. Now, there are certain predictions we can make from that notion. First of all, if that is true, if we did start billions of years ago with hydrogen gas, we'd end up with people, then I think you would agree that matter must have this inherent property, this intrinsic ability to transform itself from disorder to order, from simple to complex. Now that must be true if evolution is true. The scientists should be able to go out there in the here and now, in the real world, and observe this inherent tendency of matter to transform itself ever upward and upward to higher and higher levels of organization. On the other hand, if creation is true, we expect something very, very different. We would not expect that matter would have this intrinsic ability to transform itself to higher and higher levels of organization. 
But if anything has happened since creation to change the original created state, since you could not endow matter with the ability to go to higher and higher levels of organization, the only thing it could do is to cause matter to go downward, to deteriorate and decay, and to become less and less orderly. All right? Evolution says we go this way. Creation says we're going this way. Now let's go out there in the real world. Let's, let's just go take a look. Let's see what's going on out there. Now, first of all, let me point out, ladies and gentlemen, no scientist has ever recognized any inherent tendency of matter to transform itself from disorder to order, from simple to complex. We have no natural law which describes such a tendency of matter. But ladies and gentlemen, we do have a natural law which describes precisely the opposite tendency. There is a natural tendency of all observed systems to go from order to disorder, from complex to simple. Everything, as you know and I know, tends to wear out and run down. Our clothing, our houses, our machines, the entire universe. This law is so unfailing and so all-pervasive, it's been formalized as the natural law, the second law of thermodynamics. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what this law says is that there is this all-pervasive tendency for everything to go in that direction. As a matter of fact, it always applies, as Dr. Donaldson has already indicated, without exception, to closed or isolated systems. Now let us see what Dr. Isaac Asimov has to say about this. He certainly has no sympathy for creationists. He's a total evolutionist. He's a rabid anti-creationist. Let's see what he has to say about it. So may I have that first slide, please? Here's the statement by Dr. Asimov. Notice what he has to say about the second law of thermodynamics. This is published in Smithsonian Institute Journal, June of 1970, on page 6. Dr. Asimov says, Another way of stating the second law, then, is the universe is constantly getting more disorderly. Viewed that way, we can see the second law all about us. We have to work hard to straighten the room, but left to itself, it becomes a mess again very quickly and very easily. <laughs> Even if we never enter it, it becomes dusty and musty. How difficult to maintain houses and machines and our own bodies in perfect working order. How easy to let them deteriorate. In fact, all we have to do is nothing. And everything deteriorates, collapses, breaks down, wears out. All by itself. And that is what the second law is all about. End of quote. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it seems to me, if that is true, then evolution is in trouble. Notice the all-pervasive, unfailing, natural tendency of every natural system is to wear out and run down and deteriorate. The processes at work are going this way, but evolution says we went that way. Now, ladies and gentlemen, listen carefully about this closed and open systems. We creation scientists are very much aware of this matter of open and closed systems. We know, as Dr. Donaldson has already stated, the second law of thermodynamics always applies without exception to closed or isolated systems. And in the evolutionary view, the universe is an isolated system or a closed system. It doesn't make any difference whether you believe in God or not. God didn't do any work on this system. He didn't bring anything in from the outside. This was the process of self-transformation. The universe naturally was an isolated system which started with this big bang and transformed itself from that initial state of chaos and disorder and the simplicity of hydrogen gas to a universe that has 100 billion galaxies, each containing 100 billion stars, and this incredibly complex solar system and millions of unbelievably complex organisms on this planet. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is an immense increase in order and complexity. And the generation of information 
The second law of thermodynamics says that cannot happen, that will never happen in a closed system, in an isolated system. And yet evolutionists persist in believing that the universe is an isolated system or a closed system which transformed itself into the universe that we have today. Absolutely impossible. The universe could not have created itself. And furthermore, think about it for a moment, ladies and gentlemen. If the natural laws and natural processes, which are now governing the universe, are causing its death and destruction, how could those very same natural laws and processes create it in the first place? Is it possible that the very natural laws and processes which are destroying the universe could have been responsible for its origin? What sort of tortured logic would one have to use to reach this an impossible conclusion? Ladies and gentlemen, this universe could not have created itself naturally. It's physically impossible. We know that from the laws of science. We creation scientists, we believe in the laws of science. We think our theory should conform to the laws of science. But evolutionists believe that evolution is true in spite of the fact their theory is directly contradictory to this law. Now, Dr. Donaldson may say, well, the Earth is an open system. It's not a closed system. That really doesn't help you. Because, you see, you have to explain the origin of the universe. You have to explain, explain the origin of our solar system. You've got to have a planet here for life to evolve. Now, furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, listen carefully. Simply having an open system and getting energy from the outside, that's, that's not sufficient to create and maintain organization or to build up something complex. Dr. Donaldson used the example of a fertilized egg. And that's totally irrelevant, ladies and gentlemen. Surely you don't have any problem accounting for babies as long as you have parents. But you see, that's the problem. Where did the parents come from? Where did that fertilized egg come from? After all, that fertilized egg has all of the genetic information required to produce an adult human. It has all of the metabolic machinery already in existence. But you see, the evolution says everything started with simple gases, methane, ammonia, hydrogen, stuff like that. No way. You see, that stuff is going to organize itself into a living cell. Second law or no second law. I don't care whether you care, call it a second law of thermodynamics or not. I don't care whether you call it a law. Everything just goes down. Everything tends to go in that direction. Everything naturally runs down, ladies and gentlemen. But evolution says everything naturally ran up. Absolutely contradictory to the second law of thermodynamics. Now, let's leave this matter of the second law and look at the complexity of life. You see, before there was a living organism, there was no reproduction, no natural selection. You can't fall back on any excuse like that, as inadequate as it is. Because before there was life, there was no reproduction, no natural selection. Everything was totally by chance. Now, if you're going to suggest that something as complex as a living cell arose by chance, you can apply the laws of probability to something like that. Now, we see here in the next slide, uh, may we have the lights down, please? Here we see the structure of an enzyme. Can we please focus the slides sharply, please? Enzymes are catalysts, which makes chemical reactions go extremely rapidly. You cannot have living organisms or life without enzymes. You must have enzymes. You would have to have hundreds of different kinds of enzymes to get life started. The very simplest form of life imaginable would have to have hundreds of different kinds of enzymes and DNA and RNA molecules. Now, enzymes are proteins. They're composed of amino acids. Today, in proteins, there are only 20 different kinds of amino acids. And they are all left-handed. On the hypothetical primordial earth, there'd be equal numbers of right-handed and left-handed amino acids. There'd be hundreds of different kinds of amino acids, supposedly. But let's just make it as easy as possible for the evolutionists. Let's assume there were only these 20 amino acids. Let's assume they were all left-handed. There were no right-handed amino acids around to mess up things. What would be the probability of getting something like this enzyme here? This is ribonuclease by chance, has 124 amino acids. And that's a rather small protein. The average protein has 400 amino acids. Some have more than 2,000 amino acids. Well, the first amino acid is lysine. 
then glutamic acid, then threonine, alanine, 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 lysine, phenylalanine, glutamic acid, arginine, glutamine, histamine, and so forth. 124 amino acids arranged in precise order. Now, they don't have to be exactly precise. You can make some changes, but not much. You have to arrange the letters, the 26 letters of the English alphabet, fairly precisely before you have a message that makes sense. You can have spelling errors and things like that. Here, very often, one single mistake and you're dead. It won't function. But you see, every single molecule of ribonuclease, this is an enzyme that catalyzes the digestion of ribonucleic acid, which you got in your food. And it has to be broken down it's extremely rapidly so you can get the energy out of it so you can utilize the breakdown products. We have these digestive enzymes in our digestive tract, hundreds of them, different kinds. This is the one that acts on ribonucleic acid. Every single molecule of ribonucleic, uh, ribonucleic produced by your body has lysine number one. Well, what's the chance? Just by, just by chance that you had lysine number one, obviously one out of 20. You're gonna do it blindly. Well, then we have to have threonine number two, that's lysine, then, not, then glutamic acid. The probability of being lysine, glutamic acid, one over 20 times itself twice, or one out of 400. The first three, one over 20 times itself three times, one out of 8,000. The first four, one out of 160,000. The first five, one out of 3,200,000. The first 100, one over 20 times itself, 100 times. Ladies and gentlemen, whether you had to put them all together instantaneously or whether you could put them together sequentially does not make one bit of difference. It does not alter the probability. The probability of each amino acid being at its appointed place is 1 over 20. The probability of getting all of them together, you have to multiply 1 over 20 times itself, 124 times. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could make 1 trillion tries a second for 5 billion years, the probability that you have those 124 amino acids arranged in that order for all practical purposes is nil. There wouldn't be the remotest probability you get one single molecule of that ribonucleic acid, uh, ribonucleic by chance. Let me illustrate something more simple. Suppose I ask 17 of you people to line up. Then rearrange yourself and line up in a second way, then a third way, and a fourth way. Keep rearranging yourselves and lining up time after time after time without ever lining up twice in the same order. How many times could 17 people line up without arranging themselves twice in the same order? Well, you're not going to believe me. But the answer is more than 355 trillion different ways. 355 trillion. See, I told you you wouldn't believe me. <laughs> well, you get 16 of your friends together after the meeting and you try. Well, the universe will be gone before you finish. <laughs> Put it on your computer at 17 times 16 times 15 times 14 times 13, 12, 11, and so forth. More than 355 trillion. That is only 17. Here we have 124. Now you can make all the simplifying assumptions you want. Maybe they only had to be 50 amino acids together to begin with. There's no evidence for that, but suppose it. And you want, maybe you have to have 2,000 of these things. Figure out the probability. It's impossible. Listen, you wouldn't even get one single molecule. <laughs> if it did happen, you see, all you would get would be one single molecule, but you've got to have billions of tons each of hundreds of different kinds of protein, billions of tons each of hundreds of different kinds of DNA and RNA molecules, and complex carbohydrates. Got 350 million cubic miles of water on this earth, and everything gets diluted in that water. But that would never happen. But if you had all of that, you still would not get a living cell. A living cell is just more than a collection or a bag of chemicals. You've got to have membrane. Membranes are very, very complex. You've got to have energy factory, protein factory. You've got to have the genetic material. And it all has to be put together precisely, just like the stopwatch or it won't function. Now remember the second law of thermodynamics? What does that tell us? Do things just naturally tend to get together and become more organized? No. If you have a complex system, it breaks down and disperses and deteriorates. There is no way that these things are going to get together and organize themselves into some meaningful system. Why, that's a nature myth that man has invented to explain his origin without God, but it's totally without scientific merit. 
Here's a newspaper article that appeared in the Daily Express, a London newspaper, August 14th, 1981. Two skeptical scientists put their heads together and reached an amazing conclusion. There must be a God. <laughs> well, it was an amazing conclusion to them because when they began these studies, they were both atheists. These two scientists was Sir Fred Hoyle, famous British astronomer, one of the world's foremost astronomers, and his friend, Dr. Chandra Wickramasinghe, professor and chairman of the Department of Applied Mathematics and Astronomy, University College in Cardiff, Wales, also a very well-known British astronomer. Some years ago, they became interested in the problem of the origin of life. They made certain assumptions about the minimum requirement to get life started. Then they calculated the probability of that happening on this planet in five billion years. The probability, one chance out of 10 to the 40,000th power. That's one chance out of the number one, followed by 40,000 zeros. Ladies and gentlemen, of course, that's just zero. But they said, after all, Let's assume that every star in the entire universe has a planet like the Earth. Let us assume the universe is 20 billion years old. Now let us calculate the probability that life has evolved somewhere in the universe in that 20 billion years. The answer came back, forget about it. The probability was so low, it was essentially nil. Sir Fred said that the probability of evolution is equal to the probability that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard would assemble a Boeing 747. <laughs> But I tell people, if you want to believe that, that's okay, but don't call it science, and don't teach it to your students. Now, these two scientists do not believe the Bible, they do not believe the book of Genesis, but they do believe that wherever life exists in the universe, it had to be created. Therefore, there must be a God. Did they become creationists because of their religion? Obviously not. They became creationists in spite of their religion, because they were both atheists when they began these studies. Now you see, as, as Professor Wick Robinson Singh said, he said, I, I don't feel very comfortable with this idea, but I can find no logical way out of it. You see, when you face up to the facts of science, ladies and gentlemen, the proven principles of science have to conclude life comes only from pre-existing life. Life could not have created itself naturally. Well, what about life of the past? What about the fossil record? Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Look, if we've had millions of species that evolved during hundreds of millions of years of time from a single cell organism, the fossil record should produce millions and millions of undoubted, indisputable transitional forms. No question about it. We have a quarter of a million different fossil species represented by tens of millions of fossils. If evolution is true, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of those things should be transitional form. And there should be question. There'd be no question about it, no dispute. On the other hand, if creation is true, of course, we'd expect something very, very different. We'd expect things to just appear very, very suddenly, fully formed. Each created kind, each basic type of plant and animal would appear fully formed right at the start, with no indication that they have arisen from a common ancestor. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in this contest between creation and evolution, as far as the fossil record is concerned, there is no contest. Creation wins hands down. There's absolutely no doubt about the fact of, of, of creation. Here we see the reconstruction of animals whose fossils are found in Cambrian rocks. Now, evolutionists believe that Cambrian rocks began to form about 600 million years ago. They believe it took about 80 million years for these rocks to form. I must say, I don't have the foggiest notion how you get fossils like that. If the sediment settles out of the water about a fresh fraction of an inch per year, how do you get fossils? I mean, if an animal just dies and lies out on the ground, floats around in the water, you don't get a fossil. Scavengers will destroy it. Bacterial decomposition, oxidation, other chemical processes completely destroy everything. There's nothing left. You have to bury something rapidly for it to be preserved as fossils, and then only a fraction are ever fossilized. We have billions times billions of these things. We have massive fossil graveyards of fishes and other vertebrates and things like that. It seems to me the idea that these things just accumulated over hundreds of millions of years slowly and gradually doesn't make sense at all. It seems they would require certainly catastrophic burial and on a mammoth scale to account for these massive fossil graveyards. But anyhow, 
However they came about, here they are. Now in these Cambrian rods, we have fossils of very complicated, well, please, would you focus the slide, please? Oh, and I gotta focus here, I think. Well, let's see how this works. You couldn't work, couldn't work. All right. Now, we have jellyfish, uh, sponges, we have sea urchins, uh, trilobites, uh, the uh, swimming crustacean sydnea, sea lilies, brachiopods, worms, clams, snails, a great variety of tremendously complex invertebrates. Now, supposedly they evolved beginning with a little microscopic single-cell organism billions of years ago. Now, in the pre-Cambrian rocks, rocks that generally underlie the Cambrian, which evolutionists believe were laid down in the hundreds of millions of years before the Cambrian, we have many reports of the discovery of little microscopic single-cell organisms. Now, these pre-Cambrian rocks, many of them are undisturbed, perfectly suitable for the preservation of fossils. If the fossils are there, they ought to be found. And it is reported, we do find fossils of little microscopic single-cell soft-bodied bacteria and algae. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I think you would agree, if we could find fossils of things like that, we could find fossils of everything in between. All of the evolutionary ancestors of these creatures would have left a record. Ladies and gentlemen, I can report we have never found an ancestor for a single one of these organisms. Right from the start, a jellyfish is a jellyfish, a trilobite is a trilobite, a sponge is a plunge, sponge, and a clam is a clam. Right from the start. We have no ancestors for any of these things. Now, the sudden appearance, and this is what geologists call it, they call it the Cambrian explosion. The sudden appearance of this tremendous variety of very complex invertebrate without a trace of an ancestor is powerful, positive evidence for creation. It is impossible. We could have hundreds of millions of years of evolution and not leave a trace. Absolutely impossible. I can say this certainly. We've never found an ancestor for a single one of these organisms. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the fact that these things do appear fully formed right at the start is incompatible with the theory of evolution, but powerful, positive evidence for creation. Now, furthermore, it is assumed that one of these organisms gave rise to fishes. Fishes are vertebrates, they're like you and I, have an internal skeleton. What a tremendous transformation would be required to change an invertebrate, say like a clam or a snail or a sea urchin or a worm into a fish. A hundred million years, evolutionists tell us, was required for this transformation. Why billions times billions of those things would have lived and died. Our museum should have millions and millions and millions of the transition form. Ladies and gentlemen, they don't have one. I mean, not one. Every major kind of fish that we know anything about had its origins firmly based in nothing. And when I say nothing, I mean absolutely nothing. There's not a trace of an ancestor for a fish. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as far as the fossil record has settled it. Why argue about Archaeopteryx? Why argue about anything else? I mean, that settles the question. Vertebrates have not evolved. And we are vertebrates, so we didn't evolve, you see. And there's no, no paleontologist, no geologist would argue about that. We don't have any transition forms for fish, it's not even a trace. Now that proves it. I mean, as far as anything is provable, that's proof. Now you can believe it, evolution is true anyhow, believe it anyhow. But it's a religious faith, and it's contrary to the facts of science. But we will take a look at a few other things in the fossil record. Flight, for example. Here's, here is a fossil uh, uh, dragonfly, supposed to be 380 million years old. What is it? It's a dragonfly, isn't it? Now we have fossils of non-flying insects, daddy long legs, spiders, mites, centipedes, cockroaches. These cockroaches look disgustingly similar to modern cockroaches. <laughs> and spiders are spiders, and mites are mites, and centipedes are centipedes, both be 350 million years old. And we have fossils of flying insects, but I'll tell you one thing we don't have, not one single fossil of a transitional form between a non-flying insect and a flying insect, not one. You want to be famous, you want to get the Nobel Prize, find a transitional form between a non-flying and a flying insect. Now the same is true of all the other flying creatures, the flying reptiles. This is the pteranodon. The pteranodon, as you see, all, can we turn out some of these lights down a bit? The, all of the flying reptiles had enormously long fourth fingers which supported the wing membrane. This particular flying reptile had long toothless feet, big bony crest, 
that fourth finger supported a wingspan up to 52 feet, longer than the F-4 Phantom Jet. I don't know about you, I'm glad that critter is extinct. <laughs> well, now, ladies and gentlemen, think about this. These flying reptiles supposedly evolved from non-flying reptiles. Now, let us suppose we're about 25% along the way. You see the mutation? We had this ordinary reptile, the mutation happened with these genetic accidents. These fourth fingers got just a wee bit longer. And for some reason that conveyed survival value, so we had struggle for existence and he replaced the original. Then thousands of years later, after a lot of bad mutation, we had another happy accident. These fourth fingers got just a wee bit longer. And after thousands and thousands of these genetic mistakes, the fingers got longer and longer and longer and longer. Now, would you believe it? Now, listen, at the same time, other genetic mistakes created the wing membrane, the flight muscles, the hollow bones, converted jaws and teeth to a long toothless beak. Now can you imagine, both this thing's about 25% along the way. Here he is, he's got 25% wings and he has 75% forelimbs left. Poor critter. You see, he can't fly, obviously he can't fly, and he can't run any longer. He's dragging that useless appendage around. He, he, can't, he can't catch his prey, he can't escape predator. What's he gonna do, he's gonna be wiped out? Ridiculous. You see, once he's a flying reptile, then fine. But nothing works until everything works, you see. Now, furthermore, we ought to have many, many transitional forms. Poor little fellow. Many of them would have died off, you see. But listen, we have never found a trace, not a trace, of a transitional form or an ancestor for these flying reptiles. Not a trace. Now, the same is true of the bat. Bats are mammals, so supposedly they evolved from some, something like a squirrel or uh, a rat or something like that. Flying mammals. That means that all the fingers got longer and longer and longer and longer, you see, through the course of time. And that incredible sonar system found in many bats, that was generated somehow. And we finally had a bat. Well, here's a picture of the world's oldest known bat taken from the cover page of Science, December 9, 1966. Dr. Glenn Jepson, who studied these fossils, said that these fossil bones were found in rocks 50 million years old. He said nothing related to a bat has ever been found that's older than that. All right, then, here we have him, the world's oldest known bat, and we see the fossil bones of this creature and a reconstruction of what he must have looked like. There you have him, the world's oldest known bat. What is he? 100% bat. He's essentially identical to a modern bat. He appears without a trace of an ancestor or an intermediate form, and essentially no changes in the assumed 50 million years since he first appeared on this planet. Now, here's Archaeopteryx, that famous Archaeopteryx. Everywhere I go around the world, evolutionists always argue for Archaeopteryx. Now, first of all, you see Archaeopteryx obviously was a bird. He had the basic form and pattern of the avian wing. He had feathers identical to the feathers of modern birds. And ladies and gentlemen, feathers are very, very complex. And they develop from follicles like our hair, totally different than the scale of the feather. He had perching feet. Contrary to what Dr. Donaldson indicated, he had a bird-like skull. Recently, they dug the skull out of the limestone of the London specimen. They were able to study that skull, and much to their surprise, it turned out to be bird-like, not reptile-like. And many other features have been studied in, about this bird in recent years, and every case it turned out to be bird-like, as a furcule, a wishbone, very typical of birds. And many other features turn out to be bird-like. Now, as Dr. Donaldson indicated, had teeth, had claws on the wings, and a long tail. Now, Dr. Donaldson indicated that shows that this bird came from a reptile. Well, maybe. But maybe not. What about the teeth? Well, it's true that modern birds do not have teeth, but it's also true that among the vertebrates, all of them, some have teeth and some don't. After all, some fishes have teeth and some don't. Some amphibians have teeth, some don't. Some reptiles have teeth and some don't. Most mammals have teeth and some don't. Most of you have teeth and some don't. <laughs> well, that's irrelevant, but what is relevant, the presence or absence of teeth says nothing really about ultimate ancestry. Aha, but what about the claws on the wings? It just so happens there are several birds living today that had claws on the wing. The Hawatsin of South America, the Taraco of Africa, and the ostrich all have claws on the wings. The ostrich has three very nice claws on the wings. But no one would suggest for a moment that they're intermediate between birds and reptiles because they're birds very much alive and well today. And here's the killer, ladies and gentlemen. 
recently, well, two or three years ago, some scientists from Texas Tech University found some fossils of a bird in Texas, which they claim are, is 75 million years older than Archaeopteryx. 75 million years older than Archaeopteryx. All right, you have a bird that's 75 million years older than Archaeopteryx. What would you expect? Well, it'd be almost totally reptilian, wouldn't it? Wouldn't you expect that as an evolution? Of course you would. It turned out that, if anything, it's more bird-like than Archaeopteryx. It has a large bony crest, which they did not find in Archaeopteryx. It had hollow bone, which you do not find in Archaeopteryx, although some modern birds have solid bone. And the skull of that bird was totally like modern birds. Now, that's the clincher, ladies and gentlemen. Archaeopteryx could not be an intermediate form. It could not be an ancestor for birds. On a scale of 1 to 10, I think we'd have to give it to the creationists about 9.9 .9 or 9.95 when it comes to the origin of flight. Tremendous, powerful, positive evidence for creation. And what about man? Well, here's the idea that we have for man's evolution. We started with some ape-like ancestor millions of years ago, and then it split. And some evolved into modern apes, and some evolved into people. And during that millions of years of evolution, there'd be many, many intermediate forms, hundreds and hundreds of intermediate stages. Evolutionists have searched diligently for these things, and from time to time, they claim they found some evidence for intermediate form. And this is one of the major transition forms suggested by evolutionists. It is uh, Australopithecus. This skull here is found by Dr. Lewis Leakey and his wife Mary in East Africa. We see that it's grossly ape-like with a sagittal crest, flat skull, massive eyebrow ridges, massive jaws and teeth, very typical of the ape. Dr. Donald Johansson, American paleontologist, found fossils of these creatures, similar creatures, in Ethiopia, one of which was a female about 40% complete. He called her Lucy. He claimed that Lucy had the jaws, the teeth, the face, and brain of an ape, but she walked upright in the human man. Now that is what is taught by evolutionists. That is what we read in our textbooks and what we see in National Geographic. That is the consensus, but it's not accepted by all evolutionists. Lord Zuckerman, a very famous British anatomist and evolutionist, studied these creatures for 15 years, had a scientific team that rarely numbered less than four. He studied fossils of these creatures that are supposed to be one to two million years younger than Lucy, more recent, therefore should be more man-like. He says that his study showed those creatures did not walk upright, and they are not intermediate between ape and man. That was also the findings of Dr. Charles Oxnard, professor at the University of Southern California, using highly sophisticated methods of anatomy. He says these creatures did not walk upright. They're not intermediate between ape and man. They're not ancestors to anything, ape or man. Certainly not ancestors to man. Now, if you throw these creatures out, let me tell you, there's not much left on that family tree of man. Here's the famous Piltdown Man. A few fragments of a jaw and a skull found in a gravel pit near Piltdown, England in 1912, declared by the consensus of the world's greatest authority to be a, a subhuman ancestor of man, containing ape-like characteristics in the jaw, human-like characteristics in the skull. And that was the consensus of evolutionists for 50 years almost until 1950 when it was shown to be a hoax, a fraud. Someone had taken a jawbone of an ape, a human skull, and treated them chemicals to make them look old, filed the teeth to make them look man-like, planted the bones in the gravel pit and fooled the world's greatest authorities. And then we have the famous Nebraska man, a single tooth discovered in western Nebraska in 1922, believed by evolutionists to have important characteristics intermediate between ape and man. The Illustrated London News published a picture of this Nebraska man in 1922 based upon the descriptions of the scientists. Here we see Nebraska man, we see his wife, we see the tool that they're using, all based upon that one single tool. <laughs> Is it science a fascinating subject? Well, a few years later, they discovered some additional remains of this creature. He turned out to be neither an ape-like man nor an ape. A uh, man like ape turned out to be a pig. Nothing more than a pig stew. <laughs> Evolution were seeing something that wasn't there because they wanted to see it, you see. Then we have the Neanderthal man. Here's a previous edition of Neanderthal man. The Neanderthal people was portrayed as being very uh, primitive, subhuman creatures for nearly a hundred years. 
until it was discovered that one of the main skeletons which they based Neanderthal man was an arthritic old man. He couldn't walk upright because he had a bad case of arthritis. And when x-rays became available, they x-rayed the bones and teeth of these creatures, and they all showed signs of severe rickets, a vitamin D deficiency which causes the bone to become soft and deformed. They concluded the Neanderthal people were fully human, homo sapiens, and here we have the modern version of Neanderthal man, fully human. A couple, about 30 years ago, a couple of scientists published an article about Neanderthal people, and they said, now really, you just take Neanderthal man, give him a shave and a haircut and a bath, and uh, put him in a business suit, place him in a New York subway, no one would take a second look. <laughs> Well, that was 30 years ago, and of course today you wouldn't have to give him a shave or haircut, would you? <laughs> Some circles in San Diego, you wouldn't even have to give him a bath. <laughs> well, Neanderthal man was not our ancestor, he was man. Piltdown man was not our ancestor, it's a combination of an ape's jaw and a human skull. Nebraska man was not our ancestor, just a pig's tooth. And there it goes again and again, Ramapithecus, which for many years was held to be intermediate when ape and man turns out to be an orangutan. And so it goes. Lord Zuckerman said in a book he published in 1970, I, this is an evolution speaking, that if we exclude the possibility of creation, then man must have evolved from an ape-like creature. But if he did, there's no evidence for it in the fossil record. That's a considered judgment of this evolution. Very, very